Our case is a 73-year-old man, relatively healthy, except for some emphysema for which he's using inhaled steroids. Cough, however, started to worse. He started losing to worsen, and he started losing weight. So he underwent a chest X-ray, which re did reveal a large mass in his right lung, which prompted additional evaluation, in addition to biopsy, additional imaging, brain MRI. And in the end, he was found to have an adenocarcinoma of the lung with nodal involvement, bone metastases, but no brain metastases or other sites. Because it was an adenocarcinoma, even though he had a smoking history, appropriately it was tested for mutational um, abnormalities, and he was found to have an EGFR mutation, L858R. Based on standard of care, he was though, therefore started on an EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor. In this case, his physician chose osimertinib. Other options would have been first-line erlotinib, or gefitinib, or afatinib, all of which are other active EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which are approved as first-line treatment in this setting. For a patient with newly diagnosed adenocarcinoma of the lung, we tend to do a bunch of things all at the same time. So we are doing PDL1 testing. We are also doing uh, rapid EGFR testing because that's something that's going to so significantly change therapy. And some of the other mutational analyses can take a few weeks. So we do something that's going to come back within a week. We're also doing ALK and ROS1 to get those results back sooner because we need that information before starting a patient on therapy. Many of the other mutations we can wait on. The ones that have first line approvals would be for BRAF, EGFR, ALK, or ROS. So we want to make sure we know those. If those are negative, then we're looking at the PDL1 level to help guide therapy. And if all of that's negative, then we're, you know, if we have everything that we need to know. I do think it's important to have a full mutational panel done. Um, I do want to know if a patient has KRAS. It's going to help me think about some other therapies. There, I do want to know if they have RET or um, C, uh, so MET exon 14. I mean, I've, we found all of these in many of our patients, and they've allowed us to do other treatments. But for someone who's newly diagnosed, really just need to know EGFR, ALK, ROS, BRAF, and then the PDL1 level. So in a patient who has one of the known driver mutations, especially EGFR, ALK, or ROS, those patients were excluded from the trials looking at checkpoint inhibitors and chemotherapy based on earlier data for the checkpoint inhibitor second line showing that patients with the EGFR mutations are probably not benefiting as much. And there was also some recent data published in Lancet Oncology from the Atlantic trial, which did involve a number of patients with EGFR mutations and a few with ALK where those patients were treated with single-agent checkpoint inhibitors. And in that trial, the response rates, if someone had low PD-L1, were almost zero. If they had high PD-L1, the response rates were still only about 12%. So putting all of that in context, if someone has EGFR mutation, regardless of their PD-L1 levels, I know that they're going to be better off treated with an EGFR TKI. We can extrapolate the same for ALK and ROS, that we don't have as much data with as many patients. Um, and then with some of the other drivers, it's a little bit unclear. There, with BRAF, some of those patients do seem to benefit from checkpoint inhibitors. With KRAS, they probably do. With, with the MET exon 14, there's some data that they don't as much, so it's a little bit less clear. But with EGFR, ALK, ROS, we know what to do. They've got to be treated for those particular mutations first before we ever think about checkpoint inhibitors. And we know to treat before we think about chemo in that setting from multiple head-to-head -head trials of TKI versus chemotherapy. So those are all the things I'm thinking about. And so with this patient who has an EGFR L858R, one of the most common activating mutations, I know that he needs to get treated with an EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And we know from the FLORA trial, which was a head-to-head -head comparison of osimertinib versus erlotinib and orgefitinib, that the patients who got osimertinib had a longer progression-free survival compared to either of the, those other two drugs. Um, where it gets a little bit complicated in trying to interpret everything is we know that if someone has erlotinib or gefitinib first, at the time of progression, about 60% of them will have developed a T790M mutation. And in that setting, we know that osimertinib will work well for about 70% of the patients. And if you look at the time on average that someone would get erlotinib or gefitinib, plus the time that they would be on osimertinib in the setting of, of secondary um, resistance, that time period is not that different than what flora was for patients who started on osimertinib. 
So if we knew every single patient was going to be able to go from erlotinib or gefitinib on to osimertinib versus starting on osimertinib, it would be hard to argue to start osimertinib first line. The challenge, though, is that many of the patients don't make it to go on to second line osimertinib. And so they're only ending up with a shorter total progression-free survival time, um, which is related to the fact that not everybody develops T790M as their resistance mechanism. And for those who do, not everybody's able to then get on to the next line of therapy before some catastrophe happens. So from that perspective, many of us have started using first-line osimertinib with the idea that we've got a more guaranteed longer first progression-free survival before we need to think about the non-EGFR-TKI options.